Good evening. How is everybody tonight? Um, my name is Ann Carolly. I'm the coordinator for the evening school and also the assistant director for lifetime theological education. It's really good to see everybody here tonight and we're excited to have Gail Fisher Stewart as our lecturer. Before I start for a minute, I, I wanted to give first a plug for the evening school and um, secondly, for the Office of Multicultural Ministries, and these two programs have sponsored tonight. And so Joe Thompson, right over here, is the Director of Multicultural Ministries. Um, Multicultural Ministries has three main um, initiatives, I want to say, and a, a number of other things. One is the Bishop Payne uh, scholarships for African Americans. One of the other things is um, intercultural competency uh, training, which faculty, staff, and students here at the seminary participated in for two days last week. And then the other is in the spring, the commemoration of Martin Luther King through a lecture series. Um, especially when that lecture series comes around, look for it. It's always the first week of April, and you all are invited to come to that. Um, for the evening school tonight, was our information fair. We have two great main classes starting next week. If you still, uh, one is Introduction to New Testament, and the second one is Worship 100,000 Years. And we have another couple degree classes that we open to. If you didn't register and you're interested, shoot me an email at lte at vts.edu or go on our website to get more information. And I know a number of you have registered and done all of that tonight, so welcome. Now, to the main part of our evening, um, we, the Reverend Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart will be giving her lecture tonight on faithful leadership in the face of social unrest and, and racial division. Um, what I, great when I first talked to Gail is I learned that she is a graduate of the evening school, and which was just like, yay, wow, we can really show what the evening school does. And she is also a graduate of our Anglican studies program here at the seminary. So um, she is the assistant rector at Calvary, D.C., and the founder of the Center for the Study of Faith and Justice at Calvary. And she is there engaged in social work and insisting the black church in recovering its mission. Um, and she has many, many degrees. I'm not going to read them all at one this time, but I know they, they have just given her, and I also know she has street education, especially as being uh, a cop and many other hats that she's worn through the years. So we're really excited to have you as our speaker tonight. We're looking forward to this hope, this lecture, this engagement together. And the other thing is we're also live streaming tonight, so we have other people that aren't in this room participating. So that's um, wonderful. I just thought we would start with a really uh, quick prayer. Um, the Lord be with you. Gracious God, thank you for all that are here, that are open ears and hearts this evening, for helping us to engage in a challenging topic at times, but yet one that you call us to be engaged in through our baptismal covenant. Thank you for the gifts that Gail brings to us this evening, and we ask that you bless and carry her as she shares with her wisdom with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Gail, it's yours. Wow. <laughs> I should have been sitting in the back looking up front. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. 
Amen, amen. Good evening to everyone. I forgot you all are Episcopalians. Okay, okay. It is really an honor and a gift to be here this evening uh, to return to the place where I fell in love with the Book of Common Prayer and where for the first time a professor asked me as he was returning my paper on Amos, who I also fell in, in love with, he asked, may I use the information in your paper for research I am conducting? And I said, now that's a first. Now, of course, I said yes, because I was honored. And, and uh, being here at, at the evening school, I, as, as Ann said, I graduated in 2006. It was a place of discernment, a place of intrigue. It was a place where I was free to explore what I believed, and most importantly, what I didn't believe. It was a place where there was only one course on the Book of Common Prayer. And after we finished that course, we said, there is a part two, because you cannot adequately cover the Book of Common Prayer in one semester. And they said, no, there's only one course. So we said, well, we need a second course. And apparently God heard our prayers, because when we got ready to register for the second semester, there was part two of the Book of Common Prayer. I also took Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, a course on discernment, the two courses on the Book of Common Prayer, and a course entitled Christ in Culture in the Literature of the American South. How many of you have taken that course and knew who, who took it, who taught it, right? You know, and, and little did I know that that experience would lead to this. Because I just came here because I had questions. And every Wednesday at my parish, I would volunteer in the office. And I would ask the priest all of these questions. And he really got tired of me asking questions. <laughs> he did. He, got he said, I'm tired. I'm tired. So he went over and he got a, uh, one of the pamphlets from uh, the evening school. And, and, he, and he was Jamaican. And so he said, I'm going to tick this course for you, which means I'm a check. He says, and you need to go over there because I am tired. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up here and I was glad. And I really thank Ann and Lisa for the invitation. And I have to admit, I'm a little surprised to, to, to be here, to have been asked to speak on faithful leadership in the face of social unrest and racial division, to answer the question, how do we balance the various lives we bring to the issues of social justice and race relations? in this country and how does, where does scripture come in? How does it frame our views? And the various voices that guide me as a black woman who has witnessed segregation, discrimination, sexism, who was also present for the riots of the 1960s, the demonstrations of the 70s against uh, the Vietnam War and have seen all of the iterations of uh, social unrest since then. As a black woman who has been pulled over by the police, and as a black woman who was a police over, uh, officer who pulled over people just because I could. <laughs> Those were the days where you didn't have to have a reason, you didn't have to conduct a pretext stop. We were bored, so we pulled over people. <laughs> I'm also the mother of a son, and although he is almost 40, he'll be 40 next month, and has been married all of two months, praise the Lord, <laughs> uh, I still worry about him when he goes out because he has his mother's personality and his mother's mouth. So I expect, you know, a call any minute, mom, come get me. And then I put on this, and I have to ask, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this as we seek the beloved community? And yet the issue of social justice is more than race and the police 
although in today's society, race seems to have its tentacles throughout all of the many social ills that confront society and the church. And I really like this particular collar. I, like, I love this collar because when I don't want to play anymore, <laughs> I don't want to deal with it. I'm not the reverend anymore. I'm, I'm the person in the back of the church sitting on the last pew. I'm not playing anymore. Because sometimes it gets totally, totally confusing. And I pretend that I can just take off my ordination and pretend to be a civilian and sit in the back and watch the world go crazy around me and I don't have to answer any questions. I can disappear into the crowd that's at the back, a group of people who like to stick their heads in the sand and pretend that everything is okay. But then, come Sunday, I gotta put it back on. But reality comes roaring back and I find myself trying to rely on a song that's sung by a group called the Canton Spirituals called Fix It Jesus. How many of you heard that fix it, Jesus? Fix it like you said you would. You know, they say, you, you supposed to fix this. Fix it like you said you would. But then I get back to something I already know and believe that God has given us everything we need to fix what ails this society. But it's whether or not we have the desire and the will to actually do it. We have what's necessary. And so when I think about all of this, scripture is in the forefront of helping me deal with all of this stuff that's flying around. God's word is ever present. But in addition to, to scripture, to get me through the tough times, the rough times, and also to provide leadership to the church, I also find myself returning to old friends I visited in the past, one of whom is James Baldwin, who wrote, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all of the time. Because what goes on, the injustices, the dehumanization of God's people makes no sense. So I am an angry black woman with a collar, a dangerous combination. Dangerous combination because I will come at you with the cross. <laughs> I will come at you with the cross. And so this evening, I have to begin with a question and the question is, can we talk? Can we really talk? Can we provide a safe place, a safe space? even though we're being live streamed, where we can accept that there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, where there will be lament, where you're gonna to have to put on thick skin, because if we're going to create this space where people are free to say what they need to say, we are going to offend and we will be offended where we are say, will say things that need to be said, but will cause hurt, and we will also be hurt. But these things need to be said if we are going to find a way out of the wilderness of human selfishness that put Jesus on the cross but will lead us into the light of selflessness that kept Jesus on the cross. And that is a place where I believe the Episcopal Church can take the lead in creating these safe spaces where we can reach in all directions and bring all kinds of people, all sorts of people to the table to find consensus in how we partner with Christ to bring the kingdom of God just a little bit closer. But as the theologian Kenyatta Gilbert writes, the conversation can only make a difference in the world that is crying out for help and the peace of the Lord if love, if God is its foundation. 
that this conversation that we need, these conversations that we need, as Gilbert offers, are acts of humility where we walk humbly with our Lord, put our personal needs and wants on the back burner for just a little while, and give others space to share what is haunting, what is hurting them. That these conversations take place in the context where hope is present, where the hope that is Jesus is in the midst of the conversations, that these conversations promote critical thinking. And this fits right in with the three-legged stool of Anglicanism. You know what it is, right? Scripture, tradition, reason, good. That God gave us brains, and we are to use them to critically think about what we are called to do in this hurting world. And then after we've done all of this, after we've looked and sat and talked and cried and comforted, none of this can be separated from action. We need action. Our words must shape our action we are propelled to act to do something, and we must speak and act without fear of the risks that are involved. Because when you go against the status quo, when you go against what other folks think is right, not only do you lift up the cross, you put a target on your back. Folks will come after you. To be prophetic, and that's what we're talking about, to be prophetic is to invite danger. It is, as Deidre Bonhoeffer, who provides an example, has said, it is the cost of true discipleship. And so I ask you again this evening, can we talk, can we really talk? And if there are questions, we're going to leave time at the end for questions. But if there's something present, you know, this just pressing on you, pressing on your heart, if you raise your hand, we've got runners with microphones and we will answer the questions. And so can we talk this evening? As we look at what is going on in the news, there continues to be a national outrage over San Francisco 49ers calling. <sighs> Thank you a black man, a biracial man, his refusal to stand for the national anthem, his refusal to stand for a song. And by now, we've heard or read about the racist underpinnings of the third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner and the somewhat contradictory about the good Episcopalian Francis Scott Key and his racism. And while there's outrage over this one person's stand for something he believes in, where is the national outrage over this country's continual engagement in wars that kill God's people? Where is this country's national outrage over the fact that the Voting Rights Act has all but been repealed? Where is the outrage over gun violence? Where is the outrage over homelessness and lack of jobs and underemployment? Where is the national outrage over xenophobia and homophobia and transphobia? Where is the national outrage over the way in which President Obama has been treated? He gets 30 death threats a day. 30 death threats a day. He and his family have been called everything but children of God. Where is the national outrage that the person who questioned President Obama's birthright is now running for the leader of this country? Where is the outrage over the lack of meaningful educational experiences for all our children? Where is the national outrage of the amount of debt that our young people have taken on to get college educations that someone said they needed in order to be whatever it is they need to be? 
Where is the national outrage when reminiscent of Bull Connor's police dogs, peaceful demonstrators find themselves under attack? The Native Americans, the Standing Rock Sioux in North Dakota who are fighting to protect God's creation, trying to be faithful stewards of God's creation when they have dogs sicked on them. How many of you remember Bull Connor and his dogs? Raise your hand. Okay. Where is the national outrage against the culture of rape that exists on our college campuses in this country? Where is the national outrage over the lack of true experiences for our disabled citizens that enable them to be all God has created them to be? Where is the national outrage against those who are fortunate enough to have medical insurance who want to deny it for others? And we can go on and on and on. And then where is the outrage and who is the arbiter of appropriate outrage? Who makes that decision? Why are those who challenge the status quo in this country viewed as traitors to all that is allegedly right with this country? Why is it so easy to legislate hate and discrimination, black codes, Redlining, Jim Crow, segregation, Indian resettlement, Japanese internment, eugenic sterilization, and have people so easily follow these laws, but laws that lift up the humanity of all persons, that lift up the fact that all people are created by God and in the image of God, those laws are shot down. Those laws that challenge the belief in white superiority are seen as antithetical to the values of a country that fought for its own independence from oppression. I find myself constantly going back to the words of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these being life, you have no life if you've been shot by the police. Liberty, there is no liberty with mass incarceration and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, consumerism is equated with happiness when people around us are starving. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And yet we deny returning citizens the right to vote, to have a say in how we govern. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is a right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundation of such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations is 400 years long enough, pursuing invariably the same object events as a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. While this country, as we know it, was founded upon these principles, it appears that no one else, particularly people of color, should be able to use them. And yet no one said a word when Donald Trump failed to put his hand over his heart when the Pledge of Allegiance was said, 
at one of the early debates. Who has the right to determine how Colin Kaepernick points out the contradiction between America's promise and her reality? If there are others who don't believe in this particular method, then don't use it. Find something else. But do not abrogate his right to do as he believes to put his action to his belief. As the Black Lives Matter movement continues to exert its right to show the contradiction that not all people can actually exercise right to life and liberty, that not all lives matter in this country, their methods are their methods. And for those in law enforcement and elsewhere to call their methods silly, or as a former commissioner of the NYPD stated, that their protests depress the police. Just think about how depressed the families of those the police have killed are. It is important that those who are oppressed find their own voices and to name their own reality. The freedom to speak is not the privilege of a special few. It is a right of everyone guaranteed by the United States Constitution. Martin Luther King said, riots are the voices of the unheard. If people cannot make themselves heard, cannot express their reality, they will find alternative ways to do so. And so with all that is, that is going on, is there a word from the Lord? As King Zedekiah asked the prophet Jeremiah who said, there is. And as the prophet mourns for God's people and asks, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? To which the spiritual answers, there is a balm in Gilead. And for those of us who follow a crucified and risen Lord, the word and the balm is Jesus. The word and the balm is Jesus. And so in addition to the red word, scripture, and the incarnate word, Jesus, and James Baldwin, to provide leadership to the oppressed and the oppressor, I then turn to prophetic black preachers, the preach word, reaching back before Martin Luther King to those black preachers who took the word into the world, as Bishop Curry says, to transform it. Reverend Gary Simpson, of the Concord Baptist Church of Christ in Brooklyn, New York writes, prophetic preaching is not just what a preacher says, but also what a preacher does in struggling communities to concretize and incarnate the social indictments of prophetic rhetoric. It is not enough on Sunday mornings to stand in the pulpit and bring a word. If the word doesn't go out in the community and change it, all you've done is waste your breath. It might make people feel good for a moment, but the word must be taken out into the world. And so I'm going to recommend two books this evening, and along with the Bible, they form a trinity. The first one is by Kenyatta Gilbert, A Pursued Justice, Black Preaching from the Great Migration to Civil Rights. And it focuses on three black prophetic preachers who brought a word to blacks who were part of the great migration at the beginning of the 20th century. Those who were leaving the South for the presumed promised land of the North and who were searching for hope and healing for mind, body, and soul. So it's a pursued justice black preaching from the Great Migration to Civil Rights 
by Kenyatta Gilbert. And the second one, and probably many of you have already read it, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God, uh, of God by the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who's a canon theologian at the Washington National Cathedral. This book dissects and explores the concept of the Stand Your Ground law that exists in many states formally and, in, and informally in the rest of the states. Stand Your Ground law harkens back to 17th century English law where an English man's home, his castle, was inviolable. A man's home is his castle. But as we look at the law and how it has morphed into Stand Your Ground laws here, the castle has become mobile that it travels, can we talk, with white people and for people of color to intrude upon it or trespass can invite death. Trayvon Martin is dead because he violated white space. As we look at gentrification in many of our cities, people of color are finding that their cultural norms and practices are being challenged by whites who move in and declare that things are gonna be different now. A couple of years ago, you might have read it in the Washington Post, there was an aide to one of the congressmen who moved into a condo that was next door to a co-op where people of color had resided for years. They had their way of having fun. It upset this person who moved in. And he constantly called the police to do something about the people next door. And this, is, this, this part is truly, truly mind blowing because he said this, and the reporter reported it. He said that his job, his job, was to put all the animals in jail. Talking about his neighbors next door. How do you get to that place? Love your neighbor as yourself, but you call your neighbors animals. And then one of the problems with President Obama, why there's so much Hatred is that the White House was to remain white. Amen? And he intruded on that space. And so then now they want to make it white again. <laughs> Which is what make America great. Again, code word for make America white again. And so can we talk this evening? Because if we're going to have, if we're going to see the beloved community in our time, and I believe it is possible, I have to believe that, that it is actually impossible because too often people acquiesce and says, not in my time. How many of us grew up with people say, oh, we'll never see a black president? Not in my time. And God said, I got something for you. Because <laughs> your time is not my time. Right? So we have people who say it won't happen in my lifetime, that we won't get to this beloved community. But in whose lifetime will it happen? Whose lifetime are we planning for this to happen that we'll actually see the beloved community, are we really waiting for Jesus to come back? Jesus to fix it? So we just go on and do what we normally do and wait for Jesus to come and fix it? Do we want our children, probably our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, to face the same issues that are vexing us today? Do we want them to go through the same stuff 
that we're going through today. I mean, it's, you know, my, my niece who just turned 25 lives with me. She came for two years. <laughs> to go to grad school. She graduated. <laughs> but when we have our talks, she says, I thought you all fixed this. Why are we going through the same stuff? You all said you fixed this. And so if we don't do something, we will have our great-grandchildren going through the same stuff. And on this picture um, in July, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives held their training conference in Washington, D.C. And we, a small group of us, some of us who are here, had a silent procession and prayer vigil for them at their training conference because there is this thing that when we talk about Black Lives Matter, then the police get upset and they come back with Blue Lives Matter, and it's not an either or, it's a both and. And so we wanted to show, okay, we understand about Black Lives Matter, and we understand about Blue Lives Matter, and so we need to come together. And so we had this silent procession. And uh, the picture here is, is the, the son of my colleague at Calvary. See, he had his sign, too. He wants to do justice, because he said, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go through this. You need to fix it. You need to fix it. And, and as I think about what we are called to do, I am afraid for him. I am afraid for him. He's three years old, almost three years. I am afraid for him. Because one thing is that he's biracial. He's a parent, I mean, he's a son of two priests, one black, one white, he's half and half, but he, like Obama, can't claim that light half. He can't say, I'm white, because society said, no, you're not. And so I am afraid for him. I am afraid for my great nephews. I, as I said, I am afraid for my son. When my son was growing up, and as Anne said, I was a police officer in Washington, D.C. And so whenever something came out, I would get him, my son, and all his friends together. And I'd say, let me tell you what's going on. And he would look at me and he'd say, but Ma, you are the police. And I said, and that's why I'm talking to you, because I know what we are capable of doing to you. That's a reality. That's a reality. Because we have to recognize that policing in America was not about the protection of the rights of people of color. American policing has its foundation in the slave patrols of the South. The first formal police department in the South was Charleston, South Carolina. Its slave patrol morphed into the city guard, and then the city guard mor morphed into the city police. And so the same people who were on the slave patrol then became the police. And folks will say, well, that was, you know, 200, 300 years ago. That was, that was a while ago. But have you ever, have you ever done something? Have you ever done something and somebody said, you know, Uncle Harry used to do the same thing, right? You never knew Uncle Harry. You never met Uncle Harry. But you were doing things that Uncle Harry did because those traditions have been passed down without you even realizing, and you are the recipient of those things that have passed down, that culture that has passed down. And so if you don't think that there are police officers who still have the mindset 
of those who formed the slave patrols in this country, let me sell you a bridge in Manhattan. Okay? So can we talk? If we are going to see a change, we are going to have to do something. Um, in my, one of my other lives, I, I taught at the University of Maryland, University College, and I taught a course called Race and Crime. I had a problem with the title because it led people to presume that there was some correlation and some connection between race and the amount of melanin you had in your skin. And so uh, I, I, you know, so I, I taught online, so I never saw, never saw my students. And to begin the class, I said I had to deconstruct race. I had to break this thing down called race that doesn't exist, right? It does not, it does not exist. I had to break it down. And so I had them read a short story called The Space Traders by Derek Bell, and it's in a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. The book was written in 1992, and so this was supposed to happen in 2001, but we'll just pretend it's supposed to happen now. This is the story I had them to read and then respond to. The world is in a mess. Disease is rampant, crime is rampant, all of the natural resources have been just messed over, taken, abused. The banking system is in the tank. There's hunger. Everything you think bad is there, is present. And so these space traders have been kind of um, forming, massing on the East Coast. They didn't bother anybody, so folks just kind of looked at them. But on January 1st, they came to the White House. Now at the White House, the president is white, the entire cabinet is white, the vice president is black. The space traders have a deal for the United States, and they will make this deal to the entire world if the United States agrees to it. Here's the deal. They will take care of everything. They will make the world like Eden in exchange for all of America's black people. So, President's cabinet, folks are think, saying, we need to think about this. The black vice president, no, we, no, we, no, we, no, no. <laughs> We can't think about, no, no way. After all, how do we know who's black? People have been married, we don't know who's black. They said, oh, we'll go buy the birth certificate. They said, no, you, no, no. And so then there's a Caiaphas moment in this story where the president says, well, don't you think for the good of the whole world, you all ought to sacrifice yourselves? And the vice president, I don't think so. But the story goes on and on for a little while until we get to January 17th, which will be the last day that the Martin Luther King birthday is celebrated in America. And on this day, the picture is, you can see all the people they have identified as black, chained, shackled together in one undergarment, walking up the ramps, into the spaceships, never to be seen again. And so I have my students read the story, and, and I preface it that this will never happen in America. This would never happen in America, but I want you to read it. It'll never happen in America. But the question I ask you is, is there somewhere in America that there's someone who would think that would be a good idea? We know it's not gonna happen, but would somebody at least think, oh, that might be a good idea. And remember, I can't see my students. But after a while, I can tell who's black, who's white, who's seeing somebody black, who got black kids. Because at first, it's like, oh, no, this would never happen. And then here come the capital letters. That's when you yell on, in, 
in, in the virtual classroom, if you want to yell, you type in all caps. Are you serious? <laughs> and so it's going back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, you all would sell us for a nickel. And then you'd have the folks who were in interracial relationships who would say, I never thought it possible, but when I walk down the street with my biracial kids, and this would be a white person who has biracial kids, people come up and ask, are they my children? And so this was going back and forth, back and forth, because we had to, we had to kind of open the can of worms on this issue called race. And then the next thing I wanted to, to talk to them about was this, this chemical in our bodies called melanin that determines skin color, eye color, and hair color. Okay, that's it. And so we talk about melanin all in virtual. And I said, okay, you have people way back then who don't want to sit next to you, don't want to be on the same sidewalk as you are, but they want you to nurse their baby. Right? People, how many of you know about wet nurses? Wet nurses. Black women who nursed white babies. You won't let that woman sit next to you, right? You won't let her walk on the same sidewalk as you, but you're going to let your ba baby nurse at her breast, and I don't know how much closer you can get to a person with the exception of the act that created the baby. <laughs> so I had to debunk all of this before we could get to the stuff called race and crime. And so when we look at the space traders, when we look at the space traders, I'm going to ask you, how many of you think that somewhere in this country, if that proposal was made, there would be people who would think, oh, we need to give them up? Raise your hands. Look around, see all the hands. Isn't that too many hands down? So the value of human beings, suppose it was Latinos. Give up the Latinos. Okay, not as many. Give up the Yankees. Give up the Yankees? <laughs> <laughs> the New York Yankees. Oh, the New York Yankees. But this whole thing of how we see God's people and the value we place on God's people, that although you know this, that, that situation would never happen, there would be people who think that would be a good idea. And so if we as people of faith truly believe that all people created by God are equal and are deserving of living into what God intends them to be, then prophetic preaching, what happens on Sunday morning in the pulpit, is a way that propels people toward that beloved community. And as Gilbert says in his book, there is a power in the prophetic preached word to affect social change because prophetic preaching names the forces the factors, the acts, the laws, the beliefs that dehumanize God's people. It troubles the water. Prophetic preaching troubles the waters. It makes people uncomfortable. In prophetic preaching, violence, discrimination, racism, and the list goes on, are pointed out as being contrary to the will of God. They are sins against God. And this is, is just me talking because I think sometimes it's too easy to blame the lack of action or the wrong action on sin as personified by the devil. Remember Flip Wilson? <laughs> the devil made me do it. We tend to give the devil human qualities as opposed to owning up to the fact that people exercise the free will that God has given them and choose to go in directions that are not toward God. To sin is sometimes easier than it is to do right in the eyes of God. But sin is based on selfishness. Sin is based on selfishness. And so in this prophetic preaching, there is an unmasking of the systemic evils and deceptive human practices. Sin is called out. There is no glossing over of it. But it also if you hear good prophetic preaching, it also lifts up the hope that is in Jesus Christ. It's also always a celebration at the end of the sermon. 
there's always a celebration. That there is a way to fix this, that Jesus has provided the example, and as Rene Girard has written, all behavior is learned, so if we can learn copy poor behavior, racism, discrimination, sexism, and the other unjust behaviors that negates the personhood of people, then we can learn from the example of Jesus how people should be treated, understanding that to do so may require that we risk our very lives, that we imitate Jesus's selflessness, the opposite of selfishness. And so the words coming from the three preachers that Gilbert lifts up are then connected with action. And once the preacher names the injustice, she will then show what justice should be. And these three preachers, Reverly Ransom, who was AME, African Methodist Episcopal, uh, Florence Randolph, African Methodist Episcopal Zion, AME Zion, and Adam Clayton Powell Sr., who was Baptist. They were born in the latter part of the 1800s and they died mid-century of, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, these three great migration preachers critiqued the status quo of American society, showed how what went for right in our society was a sin against God and helped those coming from the South and also helped their own parishioners but the ones coming from the South had already been dehumanized. Help them to regain their humanity because freedom and dignity are God's intention for all God's creation. And so Gilbert writes that their preaching is grounded in the Exodus experience and their churches became Exodus churches. Their churches became sanctuaries of hope. In addition to being church, these sanctuaries of hope worked hard and were successful in meeting the physical and spiritual needs of their parishioners and non-parishioners. They took the word out into the world. Adam Clayton Powell said it is that his curriculum was the Sermon on the Mount that it guided how his church lived in the world around it, and the church in Acts 2 was his model. Powell was a, pa a pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, is still there, and we know that in 1930 and 1931, Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to America, and he spent time there. He was here on a Sloan Fellowship. He was attending Union Theological Seminary, and, and, and Bonhoeffer said that when he went to white churches, he found Christ. But when he went to black churches, he found Jesus. <laughs> because in the white churches, he said, you know, it was all about over there, up there, hereafter. But in the black churches, he said, we need to fix this. We need to fix this and fix it now. And we all know the term cheap grace, right? Cost of this, you know, in the book Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer learned that from Adam Clayton Powell Sr. He preached it. He preached it. And Bonhoeffer said it was the first time he saw the gospel preached and lived out in obedience to God's commands, that he saw the mission of Jesus in action in the black churches he affiliated with. And so prophetic preaching critiques. The church and Powell believed it was the duty of the church to meet the needs of people in addition to, to making sure that they kind of got to heaven, that you had to meet their physical needs here. And he said that a poor man out of work will not serve God long. A poor man out of work will not serve God long. And so he endured death threats and he believed that the church had to do more than preach souls to heaven. And Florence Randolph in the AME Zion Church fully ordained women before everybody. <laughs> okay, everybody. She said, hope does not center on blissfully longing for heaven, that life while it reaches throughout eternity begins in the world. And as all of this stuff was going on, you know, you're on, how many of you are on Facebook? Okay, most of us. Reluctantly. And, and, and when I go on Facebook, there, there are a lot of folks who are in the church. They're preachers because they advertise and come to my church, da-da-da-da-da. And so I, I asked the question, 
I said, with all of this going on in terms of police killings, unjust issues in society, mass incarceration, how many of you have preached, taught, discussed any of these issues? And I heard crickets. I heard crickets. All of a sudden, they're like, eh. And one person answered, who was not my target, and she said, nope, haven't heard it, not preached, not taught, not nothing. And so then the second question I asked, I said, is there concern, there's there such a concern with saving souls that some churches are not concerned with the bodies in which those souls are encased? Again, crickets. One per but one person came back and said, yes. That's the problem. And at the beginning of the summer, how many of you watched the BET, Black Entertainment Television Awards? Uh, okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Jesse Williams is an actor and an activist, and he was talking about you know, how he's glad that he got this award, and he was talking about the issues uh, that are facing society, and he said, he said, the hereafter is a hustle. We want it now. And I said, oh, people, people of faith going to have a problem with that. Talking about how the hereafter, being with Jesus, being with God is a, is a hustle. But what he was saying that when you get people constantly focused on how you get to heaven, how you get to heaven, that you forget about what you're supposed to be doing here. That if you take care of here, you don't have to worry about getting there. Okay? And so all of this is, 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 is can we talk? And so all of these preachers, all of these preachers are saying that you have to call out what is wrong with society, and then you have to gather your people together to do something about it. That we need to take our marching orders from the prophets of old. And as we look at this issue of police violence, you know, you, when you read the Bible, when, you, when you're in seminary, there are all different kind of contexts they tell you how to read the Bible, the, all the different lenses. But eventually, you start reading the, the, the Bible through the lens of your lived experience, right? What's going on? Because we know that there's a lot of stuff in the Bible, and sometimes a lot of stuff is not lifted up. And in uh, the Gospel of John, 18th chapter, Jesus has been arrested, and he goes before the chief priest, and then, you know, Peter is doing his thing, denying him three times, that's kind of interspersed, and then he goes before Pilate, and then we move on to the next chapter with the crucifixion, and then the next chapter with the resurrection. Because when, you know, at once, once he's arrested and he's, you know, flogged and everything, we want, to, we want to get to the good part, right? We want to get to the good part. But in John 18 and 22, and I had never really focused on it before. When Jesus is before the chief priest, and this is kind of in our rush to get to the end of the story, to get to the hope that is the third day, Jesus The chief priest is asking Jesus, what are you doing? Who are you? And Jesus says, basically, if you want to know what I've said, ask the people who've heard me. I've said nothing in secret. And 1822 says, a police standing near slapped Jesus in the face. Jesus was a victim of excessive force by the police. Now, in some Bibles, it will say palace guard. In the Message Bible, it says policeman. But in the New Revised Standard Version, it says one of the police standing near struck Jesus in the face. And so we can take all of this that we're seeing in terms of how the police are dealing with people of color back to the time of Jesus. And so a prophetic preacher would focus on that. 
you know, we'll do that. But let's, let's focus on this. Let's focus because Jesus got slapped because he didn't know his place. Right? He did not he did not know how to answer a person who was in authority and he got and he got slapped. And so as, as we look at all of this, we, we need to come together and form these conversation circles across denominational lines and also across parish lines. Create safe space with all of this stuff that needs to bubble up can bubble up. And let me recommend before I take some questions, there is something from the indigenous peoples called a peace circle. Anybody heard of peace circle? Yep. In fact, they even used it on Madam Secretary one, one night. The daughter came, the mother and father were arguing, she came out with the talking stick. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay? And what it is, and I, I tend to use this, is that you know, you're in a circle and you can only speak when you have the talking cross, which means that you have to listen if you don't have this. And people are free to say what they need to say without judgment, because that's the only way we're going to make a difference. That's the only way we're going to make a difference. And this, I, when I first, I said, this is never going to work. People, you know, people are just going to say what they want to say whenever they want to say. But it, and this cross, it's amazing, the power of this cross. <laughs> people will not talk unless it's in their hand, and they'll get up and politely walk over to the other side of the circle, ask me, I have it, and then come back and sit down, and then talk. Reflect a minute and then talk. But we have to have these conversations if we're going to make a difference, if our preaching is going to be carried out into the world to change it so that he doesn't have to deal with these issues that are vexing us today. Okay? And with that, are there any questions? I know I've been, talk I've been talking a long time. Any questions? We do have um, microphones, and if you raise your hand. It's on. It's on. Hello, thank you for your beautiful and stirring talk. Oh, thank you. Um, it, when you said uh, indigenous people, it reminded me of an Inuit saying, which basically goes, the reason why there is so much trouble in this world is because men's diets consist chiefly of other men's souls. Mm. I have never forgotten mm. that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Up front. Just one coming from the other side. How do you think things are different now than they were in the 1960s? Should we be thinking about things differently? We have a different kind of world. We have technology. We've kind of been, um, are we, we have, a, we have Hitler running for president. <laughs> Excuse my French. Um, how do you think, I, 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 this is what I think about, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Things What's are different, different now? Things are different. I mean, we have laws in place uh, that are supposed to ensure equality, but we know that those laws don't always work. So there's still work to be done. And I always go back to the fact that as people of faith, we are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be different. And so we can't rely on, well, you know, things, things, things are okay and they're moving. Yeah. The solution of the past. Okay, I have to answer as a per person. I think we need Jesus. Truly, our churches, our churches need to figure out to to adopt the mission of Jesus in Luke four. That ought to be our marching orders. We ought to take Jesus's mission and make that real. That we need to confront. The powers speak, speak power. Um, we need to be in the public square as opposed to being focused inward. And I think we're too focused inward. There are a lot of good things going on with our, with our churches, but I still think we are too focused inward. And 
I don't know if there's really a lot of cross uh, fertilization among parishes and dioceses, because it, think about it, it, it in, your, in your congregation, there are a lot of skills and talents and resources. We just don't know they're there because we haven't surveyed. And so if we're looking, say, we need, we need a job program in our particular area, there is somebody in our congregation who has a business. And if we just go and say, can you reserve one spot for somebody who needs a job? And then we go to somebody else and say, can you reserve one spot? We have people who own apartment buildings. Can you reserve one apartment building? But we don't know what is in our congregations, much less in the broader areas around us. But if we just kind of lift up, if we took everybody, say this, you know, in the Diocese of Washington and the Diocese of Virginia and just did a survey, we wouldn't need government services. We could do as Absalom Joan and Richard Allen did and have the mutual aid societies to help our own and to help those who need to be our own. But we don't know what resources are in our congregations. What do you mean you're afraid you wouldn't have a church left? That's what I asked of my people. If that's what you asked of your people, you were afraid that you wouldn't have a church left. Hmm. <laughs> to, to ask people to do what they do in the secular world, to bring those resources to the church, they might have a problem and that be church anymore. But, but we need to try it. We need to try it. At least ask, and then partner with another church and say, okay, maybe your folks are gonna sit there, but we, we, we're, we'll partner with you and help you. We'll partner with you and help you. We'll talk. Okay, we'll talk, yeah, we will talk. Can we talk? Yes, we will. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have to say that um, I feel the love that we reach out to each other with. And I have to remind us that um, the Lord knows all. The Lord knew that the policeman would slap Jesus. And the Lord is with and loves our police and our law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember that all law enforcement are different. Each one, they're not all one. They're not blue. They're the mixture that we all are as people. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about fixing it, we need to fix it all together mm -hmm. and not make it us and them. And, um, and it's really hard. It's hard to be from a law enforcement family and to have the tough skin. Um, and uh, so that's just what I need to share. Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. And as part of the, the Center for the Study of uh, Faith and Justice at Calvary that we have, and I have to give a shout out to the Episcopal Evangelism Society for the initial grant to start it. Everybody clap. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are calling together a, a, a focus group of police officers, retired police officers, to actually deconstruct the police culture, because we know we have to do this together. And so reaching out and making those connections so it's not us and them. Because we have to remember that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police do a job that most of us don't want to do. Amen? <laughs> Back there. Let's, um, yeah, you had one person behind me. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your talk. Um, Thank you. It struck me while you were talking that 
part of what we have is that this is a family systems problem. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about Charleston and the police department starting as the, mm -hmm. the slave enforcers and mm -hmm. all this, so we have this family systems problem. And I keep staring at that picture that you put up there of that beautiful child and, and this refrain that you have about we have to fix it, we have to fix it, and we have this centuries old family systems problem. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I want, I, I, I'm worried, I don't know if we can fix it in a generation. I don't know if we can fix it for that little boy. And I don't know, I, I, I don't actually have a question. I'm just wondering <laughs> if you could <laughs> respond. But we have to start and, and, and where is Jack, Hadley? where's Jack? Did Jack leave? because he's a family systems person, <laughs> you know, but just having those conversations, bringing people in and showing where this comes from, the genesis of it, and what needs to, at least needs to start bubbling up. But we have to start the conversation. We have to take the risk that, okay, we might do everything and might not be able to fix it, but at least we've done something. We've done something and we can pass that torch on to the next group of people. And so they don't have to reinvent, but they know what we've done and keep, or else you just have to wait for Jesus to come back. Um, he won't I, be coming. Thank you, and thank you, Gail, we're so pleased. Thank you. That's all I can say, overwhelming. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we really appreciated it tonight. Uh, the reception is still going on if you want to eat a little bit. And I know Gail is probably going to stick around for a little bit if anybody has some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Mm, thank you.